Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. I have the honor to be joined uh, during this panel by three experts in the field. We're going to focus on the challenges financial companies encounter in emerging economies. Please allow me to welcome uh, Jasmine Young. Careful. <laughs> the first challenge is to get on the podium. <laughs> then uh, Ernesto Gonzalez. Welcome. And our third panelist is Javier Gironea San Juan. Please have a seat. So as we all know, the pandemic has placed tremendous challenges uh, for all markets, not only emerging markets. And today, we want to highlight some of those. To start us off, I thought it would be interesting for our audience to hear how we can uh, affect the growth in emerging economies in this post-pandemic environment by addressing the importance of the human capital. So maybe, Jasmine, could you share some of your insights, how important the human capital is in emerging economies? Absolutely. Um, and I think it's very important, like you said, um, in a post-pandemic environment, we need to invest in human capital. Um, of course, human capital and emerging markets are directly correlated. The more you invest in your human capital, the more the economy can grow. For instance, um, let's say we have a technology company um, and I work there and the company invests in my education um, for the company and I excel in the program and I decide that I want to stay. The education that I received could possibly turn into new products or new services that the company could um, use or basically help the economy grow. Um, or whether I decide, you know, I want to leave the company and take the knowledge that I've learned um, and use it for a company that I want to grow on my own. Either way, whether I stay with the company or if I leave, I'm still bringing my knowledge into the economy and the economy will grow. So I think it's very important that we continue to invest in human capital because without human capital, it will stunt the growth of a, an economy. So it's very important that we invest in that. Thank you, that was uh, very insightful. Ernesto, maybe you can share also your perspective. Well, I, I agree absolutely with Jasmine. I mean, she's, uh, you know, she's uh, hitting the spot right there. Uh, one of the things that it's also very important since we're uh, you know, uh, talking also about emerging economies is we need to consider the culture of the, of the place or the country where you're trying to develop all this technology or the human capital or uh, you know, eventually you know, uh, create some additional investments. Uh, we are used to you know, uh, particular culture here in the United States that, that has some particular ways of, uh, of, of growing, uh, which is very different from the way that probably in Latin America uh, they, uh, they behave, they react. And you know, a, a small example is a very good friend of mine uh, asked me a couple of years ago, he was trying to do some business in Mexico. And, he's, and, and he was very frustrated because he said, every time that I ask someone if we're gonna do business, they always say yes, but they never answer back, they never call back, they stop responding to my emails, but they said yes, and they said yes many times. We went for a lunch, we went for a dinner, and, and it's funny because that, that's the truth, you know, in, in at least in Mexico, which is the country, uh, the emerging economy that I'm most familiar with, is people are very used to say yes, they, you know, just, they just don't know how to say no. I know Javier has some experience, obviously, in Mexico <laughs> as well, and, and it's just part of the culture, so uh, that human capital is absolutely uh, imperative, and, uh, but always keep in mind that that uh, training and that education and that growth has to fit the particular uh, population of that particular region. Yeah. So Javier, can you share more thoughts about sure. LATAM? I think to add to what Jasmine and Ernesto said, um, there's been a trend in the last five to ten years, at least in Mexico, which is where I'm most familiar with. Um, good uh, human capital used to go to another country to develop itself. Uh, so you had great developers that were born and raised in Mexico, for example, and they would get the best job offers and the best opportunities to grow and develop in the US, for example, no? working for these 
giant technology companies. And what we've seen in the last t five to 10 years, I would say, is that uh, since those big te technological companies are making huge investments in Latin America, um, it's um, not the other way around, but um, a lot of uh, good human capital is staying within the country. So it's forming these kind of uh, clusters uh, within at least Mexico that I've seen, um, where they're cultivating a culture similar to what Silicon Valley is or was uh, all these years before. Um, so you, in Mexico you have, for example, Guadalajara, uh, where a lot of uh, technological um, um, human capital uh, is being developed. Um, so I think it's great that you know, we've seen this shift, especially in emerging markets, because one of the first challenges you face, uh, especially uh, in the startup uh, sector, is that access to talent uh, might be limited not only by your local competitors, but also what other economies may offer. Um, so, I mean, it's great to have seen that shift and that is happening, that more investment is being attracted to the country because those uh, human assets are staying uh, within the emerging markets. Great. I, I would, I would also like to add to that as well, um, with emerging technologies in the market as well, I feel like we need to find a balance um, between human capital and emerging technologies because you don't want to depend so much on the new emerging technologies that are coming out, you know, the, all the automation, and you totally neglect the human capital piece of the market. So I think it's very important that we try to find a balance um, within emerging markets to keep human capital in, um, I guess you can say, in alignment with uh, the new emerging technologies as well. And you know what, Jasmine? I, uh, you know, just adding a little bit about what, what you just said, that's incredibly important. I think there is an over-expectation of what technology can do yes. for us today. Uh, there's an over-expectation of what artificial intelligence can do for us today. Artificial intelligence is a fairly new technology evolving every day, but today cannot solve all our problems. Right. As a matter of fact, it can create probably more problems that it can actually solve yet. Now, however, there are some uh, industries and some sectors where artificial intelligence mm -hmm. is doing a, it's, it's thriving, it's doing a terrific job. You know, we have uh, cars that drive by themselves. I mean, come on, I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. Uh, so uh, it is very important to, yes, uh, take into consideration technology, but uh, when you are talking about emerging, uh, emerging uh, uh, economies, you also have to take into account that many of these economies have a very low uh, wage uh, or uh, you know, average of, of salaries right. for that particular uh, hires. Right. So, uh, it's sometimes a little bit hard to compensate a technology that is not there yet evolved to be able to solve our problems. When you have the access to all these uh, employees, very talented people in countries such as Mexico, in, in China, in, uh, well, China, I'm not even sure it can be considered anymore an emerging uh, economy, but uh, there's all these countries with amazing talent, amazing people, that you can actually find for for really good prices. I mean, well, I don't want to say the word prices, but <laughs> for a very low cost. Yes. <laughs> Great, and I can echo what all of you mentioned about LATAM and your experience in the United States. I work with uh, multinational companies, including China and, and Africa, and I think they experience the same challenges. But I think we also can consider emerging technologies as an opportunity. Can you comment, all of you, your experience with emerging technologies as an opportunity? How can we turn this challenge that we have globally into an opportunity? Jasmine? I would say um, with emerging technologies, using it for opportunities, I think it's an opportunity for growth for the individual businesses in the market. Because you can always use technology for automation to make your processes better. And when you're doing that, you're going to increase your revenue. You're going to increase your productivity. So it's always um, good for emerging technologies um, to be considered as an opportunity and not necessarily a challenge. And then when you bring that into consideration, then you have your consumer spending that increases. And when your consumer spending increases, there's the growth in the economy. So I think emerging technologies, um, basically, like you said, Ingrid, we should look at it as an opportunity and not as a challenge. Absolutely. I, uh... Well, I mean, uh, we didn't get a chance to uh, talk a little bit about what we do, but uh, just bringing a little bit, th uh, you know, a few things in, in perspective about my experience. I, uh, 
I own several companies. I have a holding company and a merchants and acquisition company, and my core business is in manufacturing. So uh, how uh, emerging technologies fit in that particular arena, they're very different from, from uh, for example, other companies that I also own, which are more in the distribution sector. You know, we, we have online stores. We have right. a distribution and a one-to-one -to, -one to mom and pops and to veterinarians and to other kind of things. And uh, well, robotics is, it's, has come a long way mm -hmm. on uh, how they can you know, make, become, make a production line a way more efficient. And we have been seeing that being implemented into our manufacturing facilities, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, and other kinds of, uh, of very, very cool gear and gadgets and, and things that work very well. Uh, to where in distribution, for example, or in an online store, and we have two online stores in Mexico, uh, this particular uh, technology has played against us. Not the platform itself. I mean, uh, we use a platform that, that works very well mm -hmm. as far as technology is concerned. But we try to implement, for example, bots. Bots that can answer very, very quickly to questions that people have about their pets, about concerns that they may have. It, it's a pets, uh, pet shop. We sell uh, dog food and cat mm -hmm. food and other kind of accessories. But uh, anyway, I mean, people come in concerned about their, their uh, pets. You know, pets have become a very important member of, uh, of a family nucleus. So uh, it's just, we haven't been able to get that uh, technology to work for us. Actually, it's worked against us because it, uh, we haven't been able to develop to the point to where the bot actually feels human. And um, as a matter of fact, we're probably gonna start stepping away from that particular part of technology because it's hurting us and it's not helping us. Mm -hmm. We want humans to interact with humans, mostly when it becomes uh, a matter of emotion and about of mm -hmm. love and about, I mean, it's, it's very important that we keep that human capital right. uh, in place. But I mean, you have obviously a lot of experience with technology and other yeah. things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you both uh, brought up some important points that I wanted to discuss. Um, first of all, the balance between uh, technology versus human capital. And that I don't think we're there, we're at a point where we can rely entirely on technology. Uh, right. I agree uh, completely with that. And the other point focusing more, more on, on emerging markets is how do, how do we use that technology um, to bridge that gap that is a very common pattern in emerging markets, in emerging economies, where um, there's a very small percentage of upper class, there's a big percentage of low class, and a very small percentage of middle class that tends to grow throughout the years, uh, but it's not quite there quite there here when you compare it with a, uh, an established economy like the United States, for example. Um, so I think it's a double-sided sword, uh, so, so to speak, uh, about technology. Um, we've had the internet for a lot of years, um, but in, in the case of Mexico, uh, the percentage of people that don't have access to internet at their homes uh, is still pretty high to this day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but one curious fact is that mobile phones are bridging that gap. So um, a lot of people that didn't have internet access before are starting to get that access to a lot of information and resources and all the benefits that we know uh, that the internet brings. And I think it's an important point. Um, how are we using AI, blockchain, and all the other technologies that are being developed now um, to bridge that gap and bring the emerging economies uh, more on par with an established economy. And uh, we've seen in the last two to three years, I believe, um, a lot of new initiatives, uh, especially in the insurance sector, um, where they're developing new products or services, uh, or they give a spin to an existing product uh, uh, to bring it more on par uh, with technological advancements. Um, so I think it's great. I think it's at an early stage uh, right now, at least in Mexico, which is uh, where I have the most experience with. Um, but I think that trend is going to continue and um, it may close that gap that we have with uh, established economies. And I think that uh, what you just said also, Javier, about the, the capability or the availability of this technology to the different kind of uh, economic class, yeah. financial class within, the, uh, within a country, or within a population, it's key. I didn't know, you know, so we, uh, when we started with these uh, online stores and, and trying to, you know, Facebook ads and Google ads, and I mean, just 
as a piece, a little additional piece of information, I'm not a tech guy. You know, I'm a business guy, and I love to listen to the tech guys. I, I'm fascinated about it, but I'm absolutely not a tech guy. So uh, we come into this, and I, it was a very, very long and expensive learning curve for me to try to understand all this. And within the learning of the whole uh, operation, uh, we hired a marketing company out of Florida. Why? Because I grew up here in the United States. Why? Because I understand that the United States model, uh, business model is amazing. Why? Because we're leading in so many areas in the world uh, as far as marketing is concerned, as far as, uh, as uh, customer experience is concerned. So I wanted to take that to Mexico. Uh, I'm talking a lot about Mexico right now because it's the one that we've been developing more, uh, our business in. Uh, we're opening uh, offices in Chile in a month, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, as we continue trying to uh, open a market in Mexico, we hire the experience that I wanted, because I know that the Mexican market and Mexican uh, people love quality. They love service, they love quality. But they don't have access to that level of quality that they're demanding. So that's what we wanted to offer. And we prepared all this way to be able to get to these people thinking that it was a, a, a similar approach to the one in the United States. So the marketing agency we, we hired out of Florida uh, started considering that about anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of the sales were going to be able to be obtained through desktops, because that's the way that it works in the United States, through a laptop, through a desktop. In Mexico, after several months of, of figuring out why weren't we being able to sell and people were not buying from us, it resulted that over 95% of the actual mm -hmm. use of computers or technology or the internet is done through a smartphone. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a very big number. We were not being able to get to at least 95% of the users effectively. So all of those things that you were talking about right now, they're very important when you're going to try to invest in a market such as uh, Latin America yeah. or anywhere else in the world. Understand that very well first. Yeah. Actually, the Asian market and the African market are experiencing the same thing. And mobile phones and mobile payments and fintech in general is, is heavily based on these technologies. That's why also 5G and IoT are, are promising to be a groundbreaking uh, change in, in the way we can impact these markets. And you all so far have mentioned, of course, uh, just for our audience to, to get a feel, we've touched on human transformation that needs to complement digital transformation. We've touched on financial inclusion and bridging those digital divide gaps that we have around the world. And now I wanted us to move a little bit towards the other challenges that we all are very familiar with, such as legal, compliance, policy challenges. And I wanted to ask Jasmine, you as a federal auditor, maybe you can share a little bit your experience uh, in the United States with our audience. Absolutely. So, of course, um, I do have federal government experience. I'm um, 10 years with the federal government uh, across four different agencies. Um, and I will say post-pandemic, we've seen a lot of issues uh, with regulatory compliance. And the reason, because, the, the reason for that is because um, a lot of regulations are changing because we're in this new space now. Um, we've had a lot of audits dealing with COVID supplies and things of that nature, um, especially dealing with um, veteran affairs and getting the veterans what they need. Um, so it's been a challenge because as these new regulations are coming about, we're also auditing for compliance for that. And it makes it very hard for the client because not only do they have to learn the new regulations very quickly, but they have to be in compliance at the same time. So it's very, very frustrating. Similar to emerging markets as well, you're going into a new market that you're not really sure, sure about. It's an uncharted territory. So it makes it very hard to be in compliance with something that's totally new. What do you think about that? Uh, well, that's absolutely right. I mean, going and, and just regulations anywhere you go, I mean, it's, uh, it's a big burden, but you have just to go through it. Right. Now, uh, understanding the way that these regulations uh, are, uh, that you can comply, you know, to the regulations of different uh, particular governments, right. it's, it's key. And uh, I mean, as an example, uh, there is a way in many of these countries to expedite the process. Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to expedite the process, you have to do certain things that in the American culture, in, our, in the United States, are not common. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I don't want to call it bribes, because 
That's a bad word mostly <laughs> if we're in uh, kind of uh, streaming and all that. But, uh, but there are these fees that until recently, and I'm not, I'm not really sure where that is right now in the United States, these particular fees, consulting fees, were, as, were actually tax deductible. Why? Because it's understanding that, that that's part of doing business. So uh, there's many people that have begun, in, and, and you know, adding just a little bit of more background, I mean, I think that it's underestimated the, uh, the amount of United States citizens that are moving to these emerging uh, economies right. to be able to invest and, and get out of, of the United States, just because the United States has also, you know, its own problems that some people just want to get, uh, want to get out, you know, away from it. And uh, for example, I mean, Mexico has anywhere between 800,000 to a million and a half Americans living in Mexico as permanent mm -hmm. residents, mm -hmm. uh, bringing money to Mexico, creating jobs, creating all these uh, uh, great, uh, you know, <coughs> bringing technology and everything else, uh, and uh, and. All these people are there in Mexico doing business, and eventually they have to go through those regulations, and eventually they, they have to learn how to be able to become more efficient. So uh, yes, you have to jump through hoops, definitely, right. through a lot of hoops sometimes, and uh, being able to partner with somebody who is in that particular uh, community, in that particular sector of the population that can probably guide you as an outsider into that country to be able to expedite these processes it's mm -hmm. tremendous. I mean, in my case, we it took us three years to be able to jump through, through uh, hoops that should have taken us nine months. Right. So, I mean, that's how yeah. much time can be wasted if you don't do it right. We didn't do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned. Right. And now uh, the second time, uh, obviously, it went way faster. I like, yeah. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I like the fact that you brought up the consulting fees part because a lot of people are, are going that right now, especially in emerging, uh, emerging markets. Um, they get consultants that are familiar with the, with the market to come in and basically help them, you know, be in compliance and learn the regulations because it does cost to be out of compliance. But at right. the same time, we have to um, look at our risk models as well, do the risk assessments and determine, you know, what's the risk of getting into this market in the first place? What can I expect? What um, regulations can we foresee coming? Is there some way that we can prepare for this before it even comes about? So I think, I think it's very important that um, when you don't have the human capital in-house to reach out to consultants. And, uh, I mean, Jasmine, just what you were saying, uh, I was talking to one of the VPs of this very, I'm not gonna say the name, but it's this very, very large global corporation that makes, they make tools. And uh, talking to him, he's opening, uh, well, he's in charge of opening new plants in Mexico, he's opening a couple of plants, one in Monterey and one in, um, I don't even know what's the second one. And uh, this particular company hires a consulting company mm -hmm. and they pay the consulting company to solve these regulation right. problems. Because there's nothing more expensive, I mean these consulting companies are not cheap, right. but there's nothing more expensive than not being able to get to market. Right. The, the most expensive part of, of doing business is not being able to sell. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, consultants, uh, mostly when you're exploring territories that you don't know, they're key for the success of any business. I yeah. just wanted to make sure, Javier, you can weigh in too, because I know you're in an industry that's super regulated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. The, the insurance sector is very, very slow to regulate and very slow to adapt and evolve to new challenges. I think, Jasmine, you brought up an important point, which is at what speed can we adapt, especially um, after this pandemic, uh, how can we adapt to um, things that uh, would have happened maybe in 10 years' time? Uh, they just sped up the entire process of digitalization and uh, using new services remotely and all that. And the insurance sector, because it's so tied to the financial sector and the entire economy of a country, uh, is very slow to um, adapt regulations, uh, bring up new laws, or, or opening up the um, sector to new disruptive technologies or processes or, or new players uh, as a whole. And I think you, you brought up, Ernesto, an important point before. Uh, you talked about localization of uh, services, that, that how you can't just take something from the US, bring it to Latin America, wow. and expect it to work exactly like that. And I think one of the... Um, uh, more common mistakes that we've seen uh, about bringing technologies to, to Latin America is that they expect it to work um, the same way 
in the United States or, or Europe or wherever else in Latin America. And at, at least Latin America is a very uh, specific culture. It has its customs, it has its way of operating. And one of the biggest challenges we're seeing now is um, we have the golden standard of how things um, should be regulated and it should work first to reach a um, certain point of uh, technology advancement. No, we have the, the example in the US, um, but we operate in a certain way that we know, that we're aware of, that we're used to. So getting from this point to that point uh, is a very big gap and I don't think it's something uh, one or two key players in the sector can achieve by themselves. So I think it's going to be a collab collaborative effort uh, from a lot of different companies from the entire value chain. And at least in the insurance sector in Mexico, um, we've seen the uh, foundation of the Mexican InsurTech Association, uh, where a group of different players from different parts of the sector and, and different products and services have come together to help the regulator understand uh, where regulation and compliance maybe fall short or where it needs some adaptation uh, for us to bridge that gap uh, that helps us uh, get Mexico to the next level of uh, technological advancement or inclusion or uh, next wave of products or services, blockchain or whatever our next step is. Um, so I think it's going to be an effort that uh, it's going to require a lot of different uh, eyes uh, looking at the ball, so to speak, uh, for us to get there. But at least in the last few years, we've seen that effort grow exponentially. So that's Absolutely. great news. Uh, Javier, uh, how do you feel about, uh, for example, these uh, particular emerging economies are uh, very much cash basis? And when I mean cash basis, I don't mean the cash in the, in the bank account. They're more cash on hand basis. Obviously, you know, technology works better when you can actually access the money directly in a digital way. Uh, how do you think that affects uh, the growth in, in Mexico? You, I mean, uh, that you have been able to live that. I mean, to me, I have seen some issues on that particular arena. I don't know if you've seen any of them. Yeah, for sure. Um, and also in the insurance sector, because there are so many regulations regarding money laundering. So uh, that's an additional problem. Um, I think in the last five years or so, um, fintech sector has grown massively in Mexico specifically. Uh, we've seen a lot of new startups and new initiatives uh, to help um, tackle that specific issue, which is that at least in the Mexican economy, a lot of it is cash-based. And that brings a whole set of new problems. Um, you cannot, uh, a lot of services and products, uh, you cannot offer them on a cash-based basis. Um, so I think it's in the right direction. I think it's moving slower uh, than most of, most of us would have liked. Um, but I think it's getting there. And um, we've seen um, investment grow in the fintech sector. I mean, it's a really hot topic in Mexico right now. Um, so I think it's helping um, a lot that um, all these initiatives are, are popping up left and right. Um, but it's gonna, I mean, there's a lot, just in Mexico alone, there, there's a huge population and the differences within Mexico, one state to another, are still too big. So it's definitely gonna help us uh, get to a more digital-based economy, um, but it's gonna take a little longer than, than most of us would like. So all of you so far have commented heavily on the United States and LATAM, but we have to also address the other markets where we've seen the digital economy grow and a massive shift from fiat currency towards digital currencies. And as, as some of you might know, even the banks have made major moves across the world towards regulatory changes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think multinational companies will have to keep that into, uh, take that into consideration and have to keep that in mind in planning for the next few years. Additionally, uh, OECD and World Economic Forum have decided that it might be very helpful to build consortiums to address some of these regulatory uh, challenges that we all addressed so far, and that can really change the paradigm over the next few years. Each country alone or each continent alone cannot tackle these type of challenges. So I think a, a global effort is the only way to go.
And that brings us, as you already mentioned, uh, impact investing a little bit in one of your comments. So that's a great segue to our next uh, topic. Would you like to share some of your thoughts about impact investing, which has been uh, shown to increase over the last 15, 18 months? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the pandemic, like I said before, sped up the process of a lot of things that would have happened in a long period of time are happening in a short span of time and everything's moving quicker now, or at least in the digital sector. Um, so in the last, I would say five to 10 years, we've seen the startup um, uh, sector grow a lot. Well, not sector, but the startup uh, um, companies grow a lot. Um, I think in Mexico, traditionally, there hasn't been the big uh, uh, startup wave as it is right now. Uh, we've had our first uh, Mexican unicorns um, so I think that uh, has bring a lot of focus and attention in Latin America. And just to tie in with the questions that we had before, um, a, a lot of uh, human capital is, is starting to um, um, stay in the country instead of going somewhere else to look for opportunity. So that's creating like kind of a perfect formula um, for a, a, a big, big uh, uh, attraction of investment in the emerging economies. I think uh, VCs uh, and uh, big investment players are starting to uh, focus more in Latin America and see it uh, more as a big opportunity uh, versus 10 to 20 years back where they saw it as a kind of uh, a, a risky investment, uh, so to speak. Um, I think uh, that's a trend that uh, we're gonna see in the next few years, we're gonna see uh, investment grow, um, and that's gonna help the economy grow, and it'll at least uh, solve, uh, uh, in a way, some of the challenges that we talked before. Do you think that the ESG consciousness that we've seen now during the pandemic will persist in a post-pandemic environment, or it will fizzle out? Yeah, definitely. I, I think as the economy grows uh, and the and uh, as investment uh, starts uh, coming in emerging markets, um, we'll see a lot of um, ESG investment focused not only in uh, uh, making the big bucks, so to speak, uh, but also helping the economy or, or the country in, in different ways. Um, in the last, uh, I would say, couple of years, uh, we've seen a lot of new um, ESG initiatives, uh, and we, before we used to see them sort of a, a more, lo more local uh, way, uh, but now we're seeing, um, uh, for example, we saw applications uh, on very big uh, startup accelerators uh, be more focused on um, uh, socia so society changes or, mm -hmm. or um, society improvements, uh, sort of helping um, small communities or minorities. So I think um, the investment is gonna grow in the next uh, years. And uh, as more investment comes in, more of these initiatives will be funded and, and they'll be able to grow and uh, it'll help the economy as a whole. And Ernesto, what is your opinion on mandating some of these ESG conscious efforts versus uh, allowing companies to, to determine it by themselves and balance their ROI and their ESG consciousness? Well, I believe that uh, there is a lot of opportunity. Uh, I mean, uh, talking a little bit more about you know the part that we were mentioning right now, which is uh, which, uh, what we've been focusing on, which is the emerging economies. Uh, I, I feel that uh, to a certain extent, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, people of Silicon Valley are already moving to uh, places like Austin, Texas. Uh, the, the opportunities, uh, you know, all these technologies, there's people developing them from their garage. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, it becomes a, a very complicated uh, situation. Uh, I think, I believe that the United States is reaching a point where the, the competition of all these mm -hmm. uh, units mm -hmm. of potential investment are too many. You know, that's just too much and the risk is too high. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start looking at the talent of uh, all these other opportunities in, in other countries, in, in other areas, uh, you know, that takes me back to the, to the ability of, of people going and investing in those particular arenas. I don't think that can be stopped. I think it's gonna continue. I think it's the way to, to make money. I mean, there's no, uh, 
you know, it, it's just, uh, you have to be wise about where to put your money, really. Uh, I think that uh, at this point, you know, there's a lot of these uh, app companies and all these uh, high tech and new tech and, mm -hmm. and all, all that, that you, it's really hard to know where, you know, what's actually solid. And I'm very afraid that, you know, there's so much money being placed into these, uh, in some of these artificial units. Some of them are good. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that all of them are, but most of them won't make it. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact. Uh, and there's hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of dollars being played. Well, when, once you start playing with the billions, it's mainly usually because it's already working. But, uh, but I mean, there is a lot of money being placed right there, which is, is just creating a huge bubble. And uh, I don't think people are going to stop investing in these particular opportunities. But I do think at some point we have to be prepared because it's very highly possible that it's going to burst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the question is where you're going to be in, in all this particular situation. I mean, we can talk about cryptocurrency and you know, mm -hmm. what's going on with Bitcoin and with all these other uh, digital, uh, digital currencies. I mean, it is a fact that it's, well, it's, I'm not, it seems to be a fact that this is going to be for the long run. Cryptocurrency is not going to go anywhere. The United States is already checking it out to build its own currency. And uh, you have all the banks and all the uh, regulators trying to avoid that from happening because there's a lot of interest yeah. in banks not allowing uh, a new currency to come direct, you know, the direct communication between Although consumer we've and... we've seen a lot of changes lately. Many countries have adopted it. So they we're have. seeing it in the last six months. It's, it's a major push. So. It's, it's incredible. So uh, what's going to happen when all the countries or most countries start adapting and creating their cryptocurrencies or digital, mm -hmm. the, their digital coin? I don't know. I mean, is, is, Bit, is Bitcoin and the rest of the currencies going to go down? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you look at what's happening in the market with those, all these companies, and, and there's no sense. There's no way to be able to say, oh, this company is valued this way, or people are paying $600, $1,000 for, for a stock because, because what? Why? Right. It's an emotional uh, market. Mm -hmm. And again, to complement, although we talked mostly about US and, and LATAM so far, in, in Asia we have seen major push towards digital currencies. Several countries have published their uh, national strategies on digital currencies and several banks, and then the European Bank as well has put forth legislation and regulatory guidelines regarding that. Uh, Australia also for the past year and a half, so I think we're seeing a, a strong movement. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to also ask our, our panelists if we can, uh, for our audience, share some of your thoughts that you think uh, will persist in the trends over the next two to three years. We know that the World Economic Forum and the International Monetary Fund predict that it will take two to three years for emerging economies to bounce back from this pandemic uh, d disaster, so to speak. So do you feel, each one of you can share your own opinion, that this timeline matches what your expertise is puts on the ground? Or do you feel it can be shortened or it will take longer? Jasmine? I feel like it may take that amount of time. Um, like I said, the pandemic was an uncertain time for everyone. So I think everybody's trying to now get ahead and say, OK, how can we plan for uncertainty again in the event that this happens? Um, I think one of the uh, trends that I think will, will pick up is the fintech companies. I think it was you, Javier, who mentioned, you know, the development of all these fintech companies. And being a CPA and seeing, uh, be, working with a lot of fintech companies, getting uh, businesses access to cash that was coming from the government through, you know, bills and things like that. I think fintech companies are really, really going to pick up and it's going to be that way for a while, um, just so that people can get the access to cash and so that um, people will be able to plan for uncertainty in the event that something like a pandemic should happen again. So I think, I think, I think we'll be on track with that. You're making an important point uh, that uh, fintech can actually equalize some of the yeah. environments. And uh, there are several publications that agree with that. that point. <laughs> <laughs> and Ernesto, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, it's so different from what we're seeing here in the U.S. happening from what's happening in other countries. Uh, for example, I mean, I, I can, you know, I think that the effect, the bounce effect of being able to get back to nor the normal, uh, it's going to be very different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to, to give a couple of examples is in the United States, 
most banks, if not all banks, uh, were supported by the government and mortgage companies and financial institutions to be able to, to allow their, uh, you know, their clients mm -hmm. to forbear, you know, to have a forbearance, which by the way, some of that forbearance still continues since March of last year. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're already over a year mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who have not paid mortgage, who have been able to get onto unemployment, mm -hmm. receive money for X, Y, and Z different reasons, and really live at home watching, you know, streaming movies and, and relaxing and enjoying their families and their, their quality time. But that's gonna come to an end. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's gonna happen in the United States at that point, it's, it's extremely uncertain. Because, uh, I mean, you have over 20 million people unemployed right now. Right. Uh, how are you going to put those people to work? Uh, most of the American companies or the companies that have been able to get these people to work uh, from home, to do home, uh, you, know, uh, you know, basically to yeah. do a uh, home Virtual. office. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, are, are not interested in bringing their people back yeah. into the office That's anymore. True. And they're already looking at alternatives at having uh, people in home office in Philippines and in other uh, more cost-efficient solutions. So uh, now you go to places uh, in Latin America or in other emerging economies where you did not have that luxury. So people actually had to suffer through the pandemic, continue working, continue having to go and look for, for, uh, you know, for, for food for their families. And they had not the luxury to stay at home. Mm -hmm. They had to continue going out. So I, I have the feeling, I mean, I don't think a year and two years is a, it's a bad number Estimate. to put there. Mm -hmm. I feel that a year to two years, and I already dropped my monitor. No worries, we can uh, hear. A year to two years, uh, I feel, you know, I agree with Jasmine. I think that's, that's a fair number to look at. But uh, I mean, I, I'm just not sure that, that actually we've had the chance in emerging economies to have that particular uh, yeah, uh, relax, the relaxing and quality value time yeah. that we had the luxury to have here in the U.S. So uh, I think it'll, the so, bounce will be faster. So two, two, Javier, what are your <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> well, if you look at the insurance sectors today, um, you'll see a very fragmented sector. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot of small players, small and medium-sized players. And I think um, what technology is going to allow us to do um, and what's going to happen I don't know if two, three, or five years time, but uh, the future, at least for insurance in Latin America, is that it's gonna be very similar to the flight industry. So um, a few years back, um, when, when we used to book a flight, we used to call a, a, a flight agency or organize a whole trip uh, with a human person. And what technology did there is that it shifted the market from small and medium-sized players to specialized players. So, for example, if you're planning a honeymoon, um, you'll call your honeymoon planner, I guess. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that job existed. <laughs> um, um, but uh, you have these players that are uh, specialized or custom-designed um, um, products and services, and then you have your um, your insurance companies in this case, and flights in, in my example, uh, where they'll start selling directly to consumer uh, through technology investments, e-commerces, or, or online stores. And I think the other player that's gonna uh, stay or dominate the market is gonna be um, those players that adapt quickly mm -hmm. uh, to the current environment. And. Uh, um, there, there's a couple of examples in the flight industry, and that, that's why I bring up the metaphor. Um, but in the insurance sector, what I think is going to happen is that all these uh, small and medium-sized players are either going to be bought or merged, and the market is going to establish itself with a, with a few key players that cover one of those three areas. So either specialized or custom products or services, um, insurance companies selling directly to consumers, or um, online players that have established themselves uh, throughout the years. So all three of you have touched on uh, what we've seen published over the last month or so that governments across the world are trying to balance out how to manage the massive international debt that we accumulated over the last two years because yes, having these regulatory packages that are supportive and are helping emerging economies also cause tremendous burdens over the next few years. Mm -hmm. 
So being able to choose that right timeline, when do you start pushing towards more permanent regulatory and, uh, and legal environments versus these temporary ones that were facilitating uh, everybody to, to tolerate the economic distress is the major challenge. And I think that's where we see uh, a global workforce being created, a global consortium to address these regulatory conundrums because a lot of uh, money was printed in a very short amount of time. And as you all highlighted, uh, there is a difficulty with balancing it all out in the emerging markets. So to close, we have only a few minutes left. Uh, so maybe each one of you can share with the audience what you are doing, boots on the ground in your companies to, to overcome some of these challenges. Jasmine, you can start, then Ernesto, and we'll close with Javier. Absolutely. So not only am I a CPA with my own firm, uh, Southern Tax Preparation and Services, but I'm also the executive uh, director of my own nonprofit, which is the Financial Literacy Institute. And we've all been talking about um, what's going to happen post-pandemic. So as things are opening up um, in Atlanta, Georgia, where my firm is based, um, we're going to try to get out and do some in-person um, financial literacy courses to get people prepared for, um, for instances of uncertainty, just in case something comes up again. So that's what we'll be working on. Great. Thank you. Ernesto? Uh, well, we, uh, uh, back in March of last year when we had the, uh, you know, the first few uh, uh, feelings of what was going to be happening here in the United States about the pandemic, uh, we, we suffered for about uh, three months of, of uh, very, very high levels of uncertainty because 60% of our manufacturing business, which is our core business, is dedicated to automotive clients. Mm -hmm. And automotive closed down for uh, three to four months. I mean, they literally closed down from one day to the next. We're not uh, opening anymore. We're not allowed. We're not considered essential. And that's it. So. Um, we being a, a label company, Techna Impact is, is the business that I'm talking about in Texas. Uh, we also serve the agricultural and we sell the, the pet industry. And, uh, and we had to change and, and shift uh, yeah, uh, gears very, very, very fast. And uh, we started pushing a lot more uh, you know, our, our sales efforts to, towards the, the pet industry, which was actually it's been striving for the last year. So it's been always doing great, but the last year has been tremendous for the pet. Uh, sector and for the food sector it just started going up uh, the medical equipment sector mm -hmm. and and we changed we were able to to uh, you know to change basically the direction where we were going and it worked for us I and mean, we've been really really doing extremely well although uh, many of our uh, co-entrepreneurs or, or fellow entrepreneurs haven't I mean I know a lot of friends who did not do that well so uh, in order to be able to get prepared for the future, I mean, I think the key is diversification. I mean, you need to make sure that you have a certain percentage of what you do in, in technology or in automotive or in whatever it is that, that, uh, that provides probably a higher margin of, of profitability. But you have to have your safety net and develop business with these particular other sectors Thank which are needed and necessary. Javier, one minute. Yeah, um, well, just a quick introduction. I'm Javier Gironella, CEO and co-founder of Guros. Uh, Guros is a Mexican startup uh, focused on democratizing insurance uh, in Mexico and Latin America. And we leverage technology to bring insurance to a lot of people that didn't have uh, the opportunity to um, buy, manage, or purchase insurance. Thank um, you. So maybe, Ingrid, you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, that would be great. I'm the CEO and founder of the Institute for Science, Entrepreneurship and Investment, and we do a lot of uh, advocacy and consultancy across the world in all emerging markets, specifically Africa and Asia. And it's been a great pleasure to moderate this, this panel. I think we shared a lot of uh, insights with our audience. And just to recap, for those of you that maybe joined late, we touched on digital transformation, the importance of human capital, the importance of emerging technologies in managing the, the challenges, and how we can turn those challenges into opportunities. And we closed with uh, the opportunity also of impact investing and ESG conscious investing. Thank you all for participating. And just one invitation. last thing. Please. If anyone wants to invest in uh, emerging technologies, go to the consulate or the embassy of the particular country that you're interested yes. in. Uh, I don't know about all of them. Like I said, you know, I'm more knowledgeable about Mexico. You go to the Mexican consulate. They initiate your, your uh, 
you know, whatever paperwork they have to do. It's a fairly simple process. You can continue living in the United States without a problem uh, while all this paperwork gets resolved and eventually notify you, okay, you got your permanent residency. Mexico's permanent residency is literally permanent. It doesn't need to be renewed. And there's an incredible amount of, of, uh, of opportunity there. So okay. that's... Estonia does that too, so you have competition. Great. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to everyone. We appreciate your time. That concludes our panel.